Hello YouTube and welcome back to some more draft profiles. I don't know if this is really a series or more me just kind of talking about who I want to talk about. Today we're going to be talking about Alexis Pokusevsky, who I'll try to remember to refer to as Poku. Obviously that's a lot easier to say, especially considering I'm probably butchering his name. Um, make sure to like and subscribe. I have like 6.5% of my views are from subscribed people. So yeah, uh, you should subscribe because there's a cat that usually likes to accompany me in these videos and likes to talk. So, I mean, what other reason could you have to subscribe? Yeah, like and subscribe, quick, free, easy. It's literally one click. If you don't believe me, go and try it. Anyways, you want me to talk about Poku, right? Well, this guy's like 7 feet tall. Has a 7-3 wingspan, 201. That means that NBA fans have the right to call him skinny, and he is. I mean, he's a little bit underweight. He's definitely underweight. He's he's for sure underweight. At the time of the draft, he's going to be about 19 years old. He's going to be a few months. Yeah, he's going to be like a month younger than 19 years old. So that puts him as one of the youngest draft prospects that even put their name into the draft. And, I mean, <laughs> this guy's just kind of like a demi a demigod player that you make on 2K. I mean, he can shoot the ball. He shoots over top players. He can pass as well. He's a legitimate playmaker and ball handler at 7 foot. And, you know, maybe playing power forward, maybe playing center, you know, <laughs> considering he is 7 feet tall. And... He wasn't bad at all. You know, what we've seen from him, he looks pretty good. But then you have to start to wonder, who in the world is he really playing against? He's playing on Olympiakos B team. So, that's like, I'm pretty sure that's a EuroLeague team, but it's a B team. So, I mean, he's not even playing on the best team. Uh, he is 18 years old. He was 18 years old when he was playing with the team. Okay. But, you know, most of this prospect stuff is going to be coming from the eye tests and from the plays he has made. Also, considering he's 7 foot and shot 32% from 3, that's pretty solid. 78% from free throw, above average for most power forwards and centers coming into the draft. But at the same time, limited sample size played. It's listing 12 on this website. Actually, because that's combining his... Olympia Olympiacos B team, which is not actually part of the Euro League or like a Euro League B team thing. No, this is actually a uh, I think this is a Greek league. So you played eleven games with the B team, and he played one game in the Euro League, where he didn't really do anything. He played like one minute, so he played two minutes. And here's the cat. So uh, cat is here. You should subscribe because the cat is here. She agrees. Um. Anyways, yeah, 7 foot, it's in the eye test. But then you have to start wondering, you know, who in the world is he playing against? Is there any competition here? And he isn't even succeeding against this competition either. I mean, he's not averaging like 20 points per game. I mean, don't get me wrong, 11 points per game is solid. 3 assists, 8 rebounds, that's very good actually for, you know, a B-teamer. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the best... B teamers on his team. I can, yeah, you can. I can bet you that. But, um, sorry about the crop. That was just a sudden change. Uh, yeah. Those are very solid stats, but you do need to consider he's playing on the B team. Cannot play on the A, you know, on the A team in the Euro League. It's quite, you know, pr pretty obvious. Maybe it's only because he's young, or maybe he's just not good enough. We don't really know quite. Yeah, we don't really know quite yet. There's all these mixtapes here. And this one's actually new. Or on the newer side. Actually, it's not too new. But uh, yeah, that's if you want to watch those, those are pretty interesting. Actually, it brings up the fact that, yeah, in the 2019 FIBA U18 European Championship, he averaged 25 minutes per game, 10 points, 7 rebounds, almost 4 assists, and 4 blocks, which is was the leader of the tournament at four blocks so seven foot he's you know he's the undersized 
defender. I mean, he doesn't have the weight. NBA fans hate, you know, lightweight players. Obviously, that's not a bad re It's not that bad at all, considering, you know, all the stuff that these players get to go through once they've been drafted, working with the nutritionist, working with the training staff, you know, packing on a lot of muscle. So many players. Giannis, Kristaps Porzingis, you know, all the, <laughs> yeah, and those guys are EuroLeague guys too. I mean, <laughs> of course, just because you're skinny doesn't mean, you know, <laughs> you can't just pack on some weight. It, you can pack on some muscle and then injury issues become less of a problem. And, you know, <laughs> that's something that Poku can certainly do. But, you know, coming to... Hi! How's it going? <laughs> She's... She wants to talk about basketball, of course. Um... Yeah, sorry. Uh... Mainly, next thing I want to talk about is... How are Poku and the team he gets drafted to... How are they going to treat him, you know? Considering he is... <laughs> he's got the highest ceiling in the entire draft. Let's be honest. He has the highest ceiling in the entire draft... That's why I'm going to clickbait the title saying, you know, Poku is the best player in the draft. Because he really could end up being the best player in the draft. It really ends up how he... It just depends on how he gets developed by a team. I mean, when I look at Poku, I see a player who should have stayed in the Euro League for two more years. And actually, like, played on a Euro League team. And actually became a good player before wanting to commit to the draft. And it's mainly a thing of, I think they should just draft and stash him. I mean, whatever team drafts him, I think you draft him and then you send him right back to the EuroLeague. I mean, you know, <laughs> he's not ready to play in the NBA. Let's just say that. I do not believe that he's ready to play in the NBA. Not this year. Probably not yet next year. And maybe two years from now. That's when we'll start be, being ready to play in the NBA. And that means he's, what, 20, 21 years old? That's not even bad at all, especially if he's a baller, you know? And he can definitely be a baller. He has all the talents in the world. He just needs to develop. I mean, <laughs> I think that's pretty obvious. So then it depends on how do the teams treat a situation? Do you keep him on the roster? Do you keep him under contract? Is he good enough to play to be under contract on an NBA team? Is should he be sent to the G League? I mean, I feel like the G League versus Euro League ar arguments very very interesting. Is he good enough for the G League? Let's ask that question. He probably is good enough for the G League. I think. I mean, if he's getting drafted in the NBA draft, he better be good enough for the G League. But limited sample size makes me doubt that fact, you know? How good is he really? We got some other guys talking MSN Sports, saying just what kind of prospect is Poku. And talking about how he has fluidity, his ball skills, his court vision, confidence and love of the game. What this guy doesn't like, defensive effort, doesn't consistently run hard and transition which is very very much misspelled he is comfortable and confident in taking threes um and it looks like he just sometimes struggle to you know even get the ball for the, far enough to make the shot that's rough just because he doesn't have the muscle he lacks vertical explosion he is fluid athletically he isn't really able to drive to the rim which can definitely be an issue Considering ball handlers pretty much have to be able to drive to the rim. You can't just take your step backs. Step backs are not, you know, step backs are nothing if you don't drive, you know. If you can't drive to the rim, step backs are useless. And he was not impressed by his finishing ability. And he's really weak. I mean, obviously, he's 200 pounds. He's a twig. Come on. Um, I mean, he's had all this time to work on it. Obviously, it. I haven't seen him play. I'm not a scout. I don't, you know, actually be in... I'm not in the gym or doing any of those evaluations. Um, but... <laughs> does he even want to come here? Does he even want to come to the United States? Probably not. <laughs> um, 
But let's just move on to the next article. We got... Oh no, that's a bad word. <laughs> I think technically since this is a... Uh, uh, what? Well, it's not made for kids channel. It doesn't even matter, but you know. Anyways. He's just kind of like a mystery box prospect. It's like this article saying he's got that shooting. with a 7'3 wingspan. 7 foot tall. He's got pretty good passing. Um, you know. I mean, that's something that Porzingis doesn't have. If you want to compare him to Porzingis. Are they both Serbian? I think they might both be Serbian. So, you know, if you want to compare them. Defense, bad. <laughs> I mean, he has a lot of work to go on, you know. But he did get a lot of blocks. Not solid, but, you know, one-on-one -on -one defense. That's mainly going to be help defense or... Just players being bad. <laughs> it's not really a result of, you know, defensive talent, I would say. I mean, he had 29 blocks and 18 steals in 180 minutes in the under-18 FIBA tournaments thing. The one we were talking about where he averaged four blocks per game. And four games of five or more blocks. Four games of three or more steals. And three games of double-digit rebounds. And four games with five or more assists. It's very, very interesting. I mean, <laughs> what's the deal with his draft stock, though? Yeah, I mean, talking about Pokusevsky, this guy's probably going to drop to being a second rounder, I would think. I mean, people project him as high as 10, you know? He can end up virtually anywhere from 10 to 50. I mean, I think he has one of the most wild draft stocks in the entire draft. Actually, Isaiah Joe's might be a little bit more wild, if we're being honest. But, I mean, <laughs> I think Isaiah Joe's definitely a guy you can project from anywhere from being top 10 to, you know, undrafted, you know. <laughs> but, you know, we're talking about Poku. Let's talk about Poku. Um, just looking at his high upside, you mainly have to assess, is he going to help us right now? What are we going to do with his contract? And where in the world is he going to play if he's not playing in the NBA? And he's not playing for our team, you know? And that's where it starts to get interesting. And he's not really going to have any loyalty to a team either. And, I mean, he's not playing with the team either. And he might just come into the league in his third year of his contract, you know? Or his fourth year, even. So, that's that as well. But then there's also, you know... How are you going to handle the situation? How are you going to develop him? Are you going to send veterans to help him out? Are you going to have guys who can make him into a better player? I mean, his draft situation is everything. I mean, I don't even think it's reliance on his own talent. I think it's completely reliance on the team that he gets drafted to. I think if his situation is mishandled, there's no chance he, hit the, he hits the NBA floor in his entire career. But if he does go to a good team, maybe like a Toronto Raptors, we're going to see him on the floor maybe this year, maybe next year, but definitely in year three and year four, you can expect this guy to be on the court and putting up numbers. If you know he's drafted by the Raptors. Or, I don't know, I, I don't really have any great examples of development teams. I mean... There's a lot of team. A lot of teams are able to procure talents from nothing. But how do you handle a situation like this? This is one of the most unique scenarios the NBA has ever had to face. A player who should not be putting his name into the draft, but in two years down the line, for sure. I mean, this guy would be a, a you know, he would be a lottery pick probably if he entered the draft at 21 after playing in the Euro League for two years. Then we're started talking like he is a lottery pick, you know? And then it's like, yeah, how do you, how do you in the world do you treat this player? And where does he get drafted? No one really has a clue. I mean, if you predict him to get drafted at 10, you're not wrong. If you, get him, if you predict him to be drafted pick 49 or something, you're also not wrong. Because I don't think anyone has a great idea of where he's getting drafted. But I think most people can agree that it's going to be mainly based on the team that drafts him, you know? Um, I feel like Thunder probably would be the most interesting team to draft him. 
considering they could give him a lot of opportunities if they want to handle a situation that way. Or maybe they hold on to Chris Paul and have Chris Paul mentor him and then have maybe re-sign Gallo and then you just have Gallo and Chris Paul mentor him and just have him play on a two-way contract or maybe just sign him to your team and then just don't play him and just have him develop the entire year but taking up a roster spot, just keeping him in the gym with Chris Paul, maybe Danilo Gallinari. I feel like the combination of those two players should set him up for his career. I mean, it's probably one of the best mentorship opportunities he could have in the entire league. I mean, it's not really a better... I can't think of a better scenario than the Oklahoma City Thunder. I also feel like the Thunder have done a good job of developing prospects. I mean, Lou Dort, that's not a good example at all. That guy should have been a first-round pick. That was a complete oversight by draft teams. I don't really know why he dropped. But, you know, finding guys like Thomas Welsh, finding, uh, who's that center? Um, I'm forgetting his name. The center who hits threes. Uh, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I don't exactly have their roster memorized or anything. Give me a second. Uh, who's that center? I mean, they also... Mike Muscal isn't someone who they developed. Darius Baisley looked really good as well. Uh, yeah, Kevin Hervey. Sorry, Kevin Hervey. I did not mean to say Thomas Welsh. I meant to say Kevin Hervey. Uh, <laughs> Kevin Hervey's that guy who shoots threes, plays center. Pretty solid replacement for Steven Adams. And, you know, finding guys like Abdel Nader... I feel like that would be a pretty solid position for him to stay and play for that team. Do I have anything else? I don't really think I have. I have this article as well. Potential gem, Alexis Pokusevsky. And here's some per 36 numbers by a bunch of European prospects, or overseas prospects. I mean, that's a lie. I'm sorry. Uh, actually, I don't know who this Jackson is right here, but there's a few overseas prospects. You got Poku, you got DeAndre Aiden, Kat, Chris Stapps, Joel Embiid. Probably Jaron Jackson, I would imagine. Not Josh Jackson. Nikola Jokic and Giannis Antetokounmpo. In terms of points, DA was clearly the best. I mean, they just fed him the ball at Arizona, but... You know, Pokusevsky finding himself in the middle right there. In terms of rebounding, I mean, he's in that upper half. Assists, he leads them all. You know, I mean, Jokic <laughs> becomes a great playmaker later on in his career, and he averaged more assists per game than Jokic. But, I mean, he's playing... Jokic's playing in a Serbian league. Pokusevsky's playing in under 18 and this. I don't even know what GSL means. And then he has 3.4 blocks. He's on the upper half of that one as well. Turnovers, not terrible. I mean, he's second worst, but Giannis's turnovers aren't listed either. Field goal percentage, he's the worst. I don't even need to look at his stats to know that. And he's the best three or second best three point shooter behind Jaron Jackson. Also one of the better free throw shooters, making me think he's gonna be pretty good, you know, three point shooter. Considering he's above guys like Nikola Jokic and Carl Anthony Towns in terms of three-point shooting. So, that should be something interesting to consider. But I think you get the point. He's a really good player. But only if he gets developed the right way. And if he ends up in the right scenario, he could be the best player in this entire draft. For sure. I think there's not really a question about it, but... It just depends on how much time he has to spend before he can really play meaningful minutes in the NBA. And where in the world is he going to end up where this can happen? I mean, projected late first round, there's a lot of teams over there who are going to try to compete for the playoffs. I mean, if they don't, if they decide to pick Pokusevsky, is there even a chance for him to make their roster for the next two years? That's another scenario we have to consider. It's going to be a rough future for Alexis Pokusevsky. I mean, he's got an uphill battle to climb. I mean, 
I, I really don't have much else to say. Thanks for watching the video. Like and subscribe if you're still here. You like the video. I shouldn't need to tell you that. I mean, see you in the next one. Goodbye.